I want to talk about um, all three books that I've published in the last um, three years, but most of, it will be, most of the talk tonight will be about the sympathizers, so I thought I'd start off with an excerpt from this book. And for those of you who don't know, it's about a communist spy in the South Vietnamese Army in April 1975. And when Saigon falls or is liberated, depending on your point of view, it's his secret mission. It's his secret mission to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States and spy on their efforts to take their country back. And all of that uh, is based on real events. So one of the things that happens is when they go to the United States, they obviously become refugees. And what happened in 1975 is that the 150,000 or so South Vietnamese refugees who came to the United States were all put, most of them were put into four refugee camps in the country. And this scene is set in the most famous of them, Camp Pendleton in San Diego. And our narrator, this uh, spy, is writing a letter to his aunt in Paris uh, telling her about what life is like in this refugee camp. If allowed to stay together, I told my aunt, we could have incorporated ourselves into a respectably sized, self-sufficient colony a pimple on the buttocks of the American body politic. Mm -hmm. Sufficiently collective to elect our own representative to the Congress and have a voice in our America. A little Saigon as delightful, delirious, and dysfunctional as the original. <laughs> Which was exactly why we were not allowed to stay together, but were instead dispersed by bureaucratic fiat. Wherever we found ourselves, we found each other. We did our best to conjure up the culinary staples of our culture. But since we were dependent on Chinese markets, our food had an unacceptably Chinese tinge. Another blow in the gauntlet of our humiliation that left us with the sweet and sour taste of unreliable memories. Just correct enough to evoke the past just wrong enough to remind us that the past was forever gone, missing, along with the proper variety, subtlety, and complexity of our universal solvent, fish sauce. <laughs> oh, fish sauce. How we missed it. How nothing tasted right without it. This pungent liquid condiment of the darkest sepia hue was much denigrated by foreigners for its supposedly horrendous reek, lending new meaning to the phrase, there's something fishy around here. <laughs> for we were the fishy ones. We used fish sauce the way Transylvanian villagers wore cloves of garlic to ward off vampires. In our case, to establish a perimeter with those Westerners who could never understand that what was truly fishy was the nauseating stench of cheese. <laughs> I realize that might be particularly offensive to say here. <laughs> what was fermented fish compared to curdled milk? But out of deference to our hosts, we kept our feelings to ourselves, sitting close to one another on prickly sofas and scratchy carpets, our knees touching under crowded kitchen tables, chewing on dried squid and the cut of remembrance until our jaws ached, trading stories heard second and third hand about our scattered countrymen. This was the way we learned of the clan turned into slave labor by a farmer in Modesto, and the na naive girl who flew to Spokane to marry her GI sweetheart and was sold to a brothel, and the widower with nine children who went out into a Minnesotan winter and lay down in the snow on his back with mouth open until he was buried and frozen. And the regretful refugees on Guam who petitioned to go back to Vietnam never to be heard from again. And the spoiled girl seduced by heroin who disappeared into the Baltimore streets. And the devout Buddhist who spanked his young son and was arrested for child abuse in Houston and the husband who slapped his wife and was jailed for domestic violence in Raleigh, and the men who had escaped but left wives behind in the chaos, 
and the women who had escaped but left husbands behind, and the children who had escaped without parents and grandparents, and the families missing one, two, three, or more children. Sifting through the dirt, we pan for gold. The story of the baby orphan adopted by a Kansas billionaire, or the mechanic who bought a lottery ticket in Arlington and became a multi-millionaire, or the girl elected president of her high school class in Baton Rouge, or the boy accepted by Harvard from, from, accepted by Harvard from Fond du Lac, the soil of Camp Pendleton still in the tracks of his sneakers, or the movie star you love so much, dear aunt, who circled the world from airport to airport, no country letting her in after the fall of Saigon, none of her American movie star friends returning her desperate phone calls until, with her last dime, she snagged Tippi Hedren, who flew her to Hollywood. So it was that we soaked ourselves in sadness and we rinsed ourselves with hope. And for all that we believed almost every rumor we heard, almost all of us refused to believe that our nation was dead. So the movie star story is a true story. It's uh, okay. Giu Jin, the most famous movie star in Vietnam in the 1950s to the 1970s. And uh, Tippi Hedren, a movie star also, um, took so much pity on the Vietnamese refugees that she encountered at Camp Pendleton that she had her personal manicurist come and train some of these women in the arts of manicuring, which is how 40 years later, Vietnamese people have come to take over 51% of the nail salon industry in the United States. Okay. True story. Um, and so that's either a pro-refugee story or an anti-refugee story, depending on your point of view. And personally, because I'm a refugee, I think it's a pro-refugee story. Um, much of my work recently has been about trying to clarify the distinction between refugees and immigrants, because when the sympathizer came out, it, um, some of the acclaim about it, was about me being an immigrant and the novel being an immigrant story and how all of these things affirmed the possibilities of American culture. But I'm not an immigrant, I'm a refugee. And I think the, the distinction is really crucial, especially today in the United States, also here in parts of Europe, where many people don't want refugees to come into their country. Well, if the United States had adopted that policy towards me, you wouldn't have a Pulitzer Prize winner here today. <laughs> uh, of course, that doesn't mean that we should just admit people because they might win Pulitzer Prizes. We should admit people into our countries because we're humane. And I benefited from that humanity. And refugees are the unwanted, but we're unwanted oftentimes because of circumstances completely beyond our control. And obviously for Vietnamese refugees coming to the United States, coming to France, coming to Germany, coming to dozens of countries across the world, uh, we came because of something called the Vietnam War. And so much of my uh, life has been spent trying to understand what it means to be an American, to be a Vietnamese, to be a refugee, to be an immigrant, to be someone who has been shaped indelibly by the Vietnam War. So here's a paragraph from a book called Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, which came out in 2016. And it's the critical companion to The Sympathizer because it makes very explicit what my thinking is, is about history and memory and war, um, the Vietnam War in particular, but when I say the Vietnam War, I mean, uh, in that, that book I talk about not just Vietnam, but Cambodia, Laos, um, the Vietnamese and Southeast Asian diaspora, and uh, South Korea. I mean, the, the Vietnam War was actually an international war that just happened to take place in Vietnam, but mm. with deeply, which deeply involved all these other countries as well. So this is the opening of the book. I was born in Vietnam, but made in America. I count myself among those Vietnamese dismayed by America's deeds, but tempted to believe in its words. I also count myself among those Americans who often do not know what to make of Vietnam and want to know what to make of it. Americans, as well as many people the world over, tend to mistake Vietnam with the war named in its honor, or dishonor, as the case may be. This confusion has no doubt led to some of, my, some of my own uncertainty about what it means to be a man with two countries, as well as the inheritor of two revolutions. Today, the Vietnamese and American revolutions manufacture memories, only to absolve the hardening of their arteries. For those of us who consider ourselves to be inheritors of one or both of these revolutions, 
or who have been influenced by them in some way, we have to know how we make memories and how we forget them so that we can beat their hearts back to life. So that's been my life's work for a few decades, trying to understand these two countries, these two histories, and the meaning of war. You know, because in the United States and probably in many other places, when people say war, they mean something that's fought by soldiers. And in the United States, they really mean something that's fought somewhere else, outside of the country. But I think for many people, wars take place in their own countries, and that certainly was true for the Vietnamese, the Cambodians, the Laotians. And war was not something that only involved soldiers. Uh, war involved civilians as well. War produces refugees. And the Vietnam War was not unique for being a war that killed more civilians than soldiers. And that's been true throughout the 20th century. So much of my work has been attempting to force people to confront this reality that we need to have a different understanding of war. War for me is not about soldiers and tanks and planes. We're not just about that. It's about military industrial complexes. It's about how all of us who are taxpayers are implicated in the military industries and ideologies of our society. And for me, as a Vietnamese and as an American, looking at two countries that are very militaristic and whose histories have been deeply defined by war, this attempt to redefine that history to include civilians and refugees is deeply important to me. So I came to the United States and uh, we settled in San Jose, California, which was home to the second largest Vietnamese community in the United States, which means the second largest Vietnamese community outside of Vietnam, I think. And my parents opened a grocery store and I remember walking down the street in that grocery store and seeing a sign in a store window that said, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese. Oh. And even at a very young age, I knew that that sign was saying a story, telling a story. Telling a story that didn't include me or my parents and actually deliberately excluded us. And I think that was one of the things that put a seed in my mind that it would be important to one day become a storyteller to contest those kinds of stories. That growing up as, an, as, a, as a Vietnamese and as an American, I was well aware of all these American stories about Vietnam, and I was well aware that all those stories did not match up with the stories I heard from Vietnamese people. That the stories I heard uh, from Vietnamese refugees, my parents included, but the rest of the community, were stories about loss, and pain, and melancholy, and bitterness, and regret, and longing, and so many other deeply important human emotions that just were not understood or heard outside of our community. So eventually I decided I wanted to be one of those storytellers who would try to talk about these Vietnamese experiences. So that led me to write the stories that eventually became The Refugees, which was published this year in 2017. And uh, I'm going to read just a couple pages from the very beginning of this book, um, which is a book of stories about Vietnamese refugees and what happened to them, both what turned them into refugees, but how they survived over decades, and also the people who are not Vietnamese that they encountered. So the opening story is called Black Eyed Women, and uh, here's how it starts. Fame would strike someone, usually the kind that healthy-minded people would not wish upon themselves, such as being kidnapped and kept a prisoner for years, humiliated in a sex scandal, or surviving something typically fatal. These survivors needed someone to help write their memoirs, and their agents might eventually come across me. At least your name's not on anything, my mother once said. When I mentioned that I would not mind being thanked in the acknowledgments, she said, let me tell you a story. It would be the first time I heard this story, but not the last. In our homeland, she went on, there was a reporter who said the government tortured the people in prison. So the government does to him exactly what he said they did to others. They send him away, and no one ever sees him again. That's what happens to writers who put their names on things. <laughs> By the time Victor Devoto chose me, I had resigned myself to being one of those writers whose names did not appear on book covers. Mm -hmm. His agent had given him a book that I had ghostwritten. Its ostensible author, the father of a boy who had shot and killed several people at his school. I identify with the father's guilt, 
Victor said to me. He was the sole survivor of an airplane crash. 173 others having perished, including his wife and children. What was left of him appeared on all the talk shows. His body there, but not much else. The voice was a soft monotone, and the eyes, on the occasions they looked up, seemed to hold within them the silhouettes of mournful people. His publishers said that it was urgent that he finish his story while audiences still remembered the tragedy. And this was my preoccupation on the day my dead brother returned to me. So it's a ghost story. And growing up in the Vietnamese community, I heard many ghost stories. Sometimes there were literal ghost stories. I mean, the idea of someone who's dead coming back and making a reappearance was very widespread, even for Catholics, you know? And, but even more important were the figurative ghost stories. That is to say that almost everyone I knew who was a first-generation refugee was haunted by the past. Almost everybody I knew had their family divided. Almost everybody I knew had people who had stayed behind. And I think that my family was actually lucky because no one in our immediate family had died violently in the course of the war. But so many, almost everybody else I knew had had that happen to their family. So people were haunted. Even people who did not remember these things, people my age, what we call in the United States the 1.5 generation, we came as children, we were raised here. Even the second gener generation, born in the United States, raised in the United States, I've met so many of these people who said to me, they're haunted too because their parents passed on <clears throat> these experiences and these emotions to them. So The Refugees is very much uh, a book, some, sometimes about literal ghosts but, ghosts, but most often about figurative ghosts. And I thought that would be important to try to tell some of these stories. Because again, growing up in the United States, when Americans said the word Vietnam, what they meant was the Vietnam War. And when they said the Vietnam War, what they meant was the American War, which is to say how the war impacted Americans, which is important. 58,000 Americans died, the country was divided, and so on. But three million Vietnamese people died of all sides. Three million Cambodians and Laotians died during and after the war. And none of that was captured in the American stories that I, that I read about in books or in the dozens of American movies that were made about the Vietnam War. And as a young boy and young man, I was obsessed with the Vietnam War, and I saw almost every movie that Hollywood made about the Vietnam War, which is an exercise I recommend to nobody, okay? <laughs> especially if you're Vietnamese. So that's why when I wrote The Sympathizer, and this is the last thing I'm going to read, and then we'll take questions. When I wrote The Sympathizer, I had to include a long section on Hollywood. Uh, I had to take my revenge. Uh, this was my chance. So our sympathizer, our narrator, uh, once he becomes a refugee in the United States, has to survive somehow. He gets a number of jobs. One of the jobs that he gets is to be the authenticity consultant on the making of an epic Vietnam War movie to be shot in the Philippines <laughs> that looks suspiciously like the Apocalypse Now. <laughs> But if Francis Ford Coppola's lawyer is ever to ask, is not Apocalypse Now. And so here in this section, um, our narrator uh, has read the, the screenplay of this movie and is meeting with the director in his Hollywood home. Um, and the director is known only as the auteur. My meeting with the auteur had gone on for a while longer, mostly in a more subdued fashion with me pointing out that the lack of speaking parts for Vietnamese people in a movie set in Vietnam might be interpreted as cultural insensitivity. Do you not think it would be a little more believable, I said, a little more realistic, a little more authentic for a movie set in a certain country, for the people in that country to have something to say? <laughs> Instead of having your screenplay direct, as it does now, cut to villagers speaking in their own language. Do you think it might not be decent to let them actually say something? Instead of simply acknowledging that there is some kind of 
sound coming from their mouths? Mm -hmm. Could you not even just have them speak a heavily accented English? You know what I mean, Ching Chong English? <laughs> just to pretend they are speaking in an Asian language that somehow American audiences can strangely understand? <laughs> The auteur grimaced and said, very interesting, great stuff, loved it, but I had a question. What was it? Oh yes, how many movies have you made? None, isn't that right? None, zero, zilch. Nada. Nothing. And however you say it in your language. So thank you for telling me how to do my job. Now get the hell out of my house and come back after you've made a movie or two. Maybe then I'll listen to one, of two or your, one or two of your cheap ideas. So in the aftermath of The Sympathizer being published, I've uh, <laughs> met with quite a few Hollywood people. <laughs> and none of them dispute this characterization. I confess to being angry with the auteur. But was I wrong in being angry? This was especially the case when he acknowledged he did not even know that Montagnard was simply a French catch-all term for the dozens of Highland minorities. The movie is called The Hamlet. It's about the American Special Forces, the Green Berets, who go into this Central Highlands village in Vietnam and train the local minority people who they call the Montagnards to, to defend themselves against the Viet Cong. What if, I said to him, I wrote a screenplay about the American West and simply called all the natives Indians? <laughs> You'd want to know whether the cavalry was fighting the Navajo or Apache or Comanche, right? Likewise, I would want to know when you say these people are Montagnards, whether we speak of the Brew or the Numb or the Tay. Let me tell you a secret, the auteur said. You ready? Here it is. No one gives a shit. <laughs> he was amused by my wordlessness. To see me without words is like seeing one of those Egyptian felines without hair, a rare and not necessarily desirable occasion. How could I be so dense? How could I be so deluded? I naively believed that I could divert the Hollywood organism from its goal, the simultaneous lobotomization and pickpocketing of the world's audiences. Hollywood did not just make horror movie monsters, it was its own horror movie monster, smashing me under its foot. I had failed, and the auteur would make the hamlet as he intended, with my countrymen serving merely as raw material for an epic about white men saving good yellow people from bad yellow people. I pitied the French for their naivete in believing they had to visit a country in order to exploit it. Hollywood was much more efficient imagining the countries it wanted to exploit. I was maddened by my helplessness before the auteur's imagination and machinations. His arrogance marked something new in the world, for this was the first war where the losers would write history instead of the victors, courtesy of the most efficient propaganda machine ever created, with all due respect to Joseph Goebbels and the Nazis who never achieved global domination. Hollywood's high priests understood innately the observation of Milton's Satan, that it was better to rule in hell than serve in heaven, better to be villain, loser, or anti-hero than virtuous extra so long as one commanded the bright lights of center stage. In this forthcoming Hollywood trompe all the Vietnamese of any side would come out poorly, herded into the roles of the poor, the innocent, the evil, or the corrupt. <laughs>
Our fate was not to be merely mute. We were to be struck dumb. Thank you. Okay. So you want to know about my personal trauma? I think that was the gist of the question. Okay. I, no, no worries. I talk about it all the time. I'm a writer. I have to like flay myself in public. Um, uh, well, you know, the, the most personal trauma, um, and seemingly the most insignificant in some ways, was that when I came to the United States in 1975, it was a, in May 1975 probably, um, I went to one of those four refugee camps. Mine was Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. And in order to leave a refugee camp, uh, a refugee had to have a sponsor, an American sponsor, who would guarantee that the refugee would not be a burden on American society. Hmm. So, in our case, my family of four, well, first of all, my family of five, my adopted sister didn't make it <laughs> to the United States. She was left behind in a very contorted series of events and has stayed your entire life in Vietnam. That was traumatic. I grew up well aware that there was somebody missing in our family. That absent presence in my life uh, is a haunting. And that idea of the absent presence of someone or something missing in my life would come to define much of my work. But in the, in, in the refugee camp, we could not find a sponsor that would take all four of us, my father, my mother, my brother, older brother, and myself. So instead, there were three sponsors. One sponsor took my parents, one sponsor took my 10-year-old uh, brother, and another sponsor took four-year-old me. And when you're four years old and you're separated from your parents, that's pretty traumatic. Mm -hmm. you know. And I, uh, I don't think it was for very long. I think it was just for the summer. But I remember how, 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 you know, bawling my eyes out at being taken away, reunited, taken away. And I think that, for me, that, that was an experience that I actually buried deeply within myself for decades. You know? But in thinking about my past, and thinking about being a writer, and confronting as directly as I can my own personal history, I had to go back to that moment and I had to think, maybe that was actually really a crucial moment in my identity, being taken away, fearing abandonment. And I think that it's always remained with me. And then that extended itself into growing up in San Jose, um, where I felt that I was always divided. I was a, I felt like I was a, a spy in my parents' Vietnamese household. I felt like I was an American, you know. And like, oh, you know, why are we eating this strange food? Why are we talking this strange language? Why, why, are, why are we doing these strange customs? And then when I went outside into the rest of American society, I felt like a Vietnamese spying on them. And so I took that emotional experience. That's not very interesting, I think of being divided, of being a, feeling like a spy, of feeling abandoned, and I grafted it onto my spy in the book and then exaggerated it really greatly, making them much more traumatic for him. And as so much as the spy story is concerned, um, yes, there, were really, there really were uh, many communist spies in South Vietnam, um, and the most famous spy, Phạm Xuân An, uh, was so successful that he was promoted to major general for his activities. And he actually had come to the United States in the 1950s to study at a, at a Southern California college before he went back and became one of the premier uh, confidants of the American press hmm. in Vietnam. And a couple of books have been written about him. So I had heard about his story and that stayed in my mind is that when my agent told me to write a novel, I thought, good, I'll write a spy novel. Because I want this novel to at least be entertaining as well. Other questions? Yes. I was wondering if you said your parents um, had a shock um, in the um, war years. Uh, you describe this, this these people collecting money uh, in order to uh, help uh, a, an army to recover. Uh, is, have your parents uh, experienced that? The question was about a story like a in, mafia thing. Yeah, this question about a story called War Years in the Refugees, which is actually the only autobiographical story I've ever written. And part of what happens in that story is that a woman comes to this this grocery store, which is based on my parents' grocery store, and uh, you know basically says, "Look, give us money or to to fund the anti-communist cause because there really were there really were uh, Vietnamese veterans, South Vietnamese veterans in Thailand organizing to try to invade and take Vietnam back, which then became the basis for the sympathizer. And so this woman comes to the shop and says, give us money for this cause or we'll call you a communist. Um, and something like that really did happen to my mother. The rest of the story, uh, the rest of the story involving the extortion didn't happen, but that really did happen. And I grew up in San Jose, 
well aware of this history. Because you know, you, I would go to the New Year celebrations and I would see pictures and tables announcing that this was the cause that they were raising money for with pictures of these guys and camouflage uniforms in the Thai jungle. And there were rumors that the first Vietnamese pho chain, pho, you know, pho, delicious beef noodle soup pho, that you call pho, okay, was, st was started in order to pay for this um, counter-revolution, which also makes its way into the sympathizer as well. And how was that accepted? Within American society. How is what accepted in yeah. American society? How is, how is what the, accepted? The, the fact that there was that, um, those people trying to, uh, to get together. Okay. People. The question is how, is, how is it accepted in American society that there was this counter revolutionary effort? No, mo most Americans had no idea. Most, like I said, most Americans know nothing about Vietnamese people, one way or another. Right? So they had no idea that we were undergoing this dramatic effort to try to take our country back, which is worthy of Hollywood movie. Uh, you know, it was a very serious thing because, you know, many, several, five, Vietnamese American journalists were murdered during this time period of the 1980s because supposedly they espoused too many communist sympathies, right? And no, no one was ever convicted for these murders, but people, some people suspect that it was the, the guys who were organizing the counter-revolution, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. When non-refugees, particularly Americans, ask you to share about your trauma? I think that, um, I think these questions are well-intentioned. I also think that most people have no clue, you know, which is why I don't, you know, before I had to become an author and a public figure and then play myself in public and then try to explain all these issues, I would never get into these issues with people, with non-refugees, with non-Vietnamese people. Because growing up, it was very clear to me that, again, most Americans had no clue. And after the sympathizer and the refugees came out, I've seen so many messages by people saying, you know, I, I knew Vietnamese refugees, went to school with them, they were in my neighborhood, took the bus with them. I had no idea this is what was happening. So there's no way that I'm going to talk to someone who has, knows, knows nothing about this and say, yeah, I have an adopted sister, she was left behind in Vietnam, I haven't seen her for 40 years. Most Americans would have no idea what to do with that story. It's really something that you only want to talk about with people who understand this experience, because otherwise then you have to get into this whole explanation and then you have to delve into your own past and it hurts, right, to do that. And most people don't want to do that for very good mm -hmm. reason. So I think that in response to your question, I would say, I don't know, I mean, be gentle. <laughs> Imagine how you would feel if you had a deep, dark, traumatic experience and someone says, tell me about it. Mm -hmm. I like, don't want to do that. Just open the door. Let them be a friend and let them come to you when they want to. But if you meet someone for the first time and say, tell me about your trauma, it must have been awful. <laughs> it's not a good conversation starter. You jump in the blue chair. So um, I'm speaking from the perspective as an American, actually, of Vietnamese heritage. I happen to be visiting here very coincidentally. But I also live in Saigon. I moved about two years ago. Um, and a lot of the questions that you brought up, like you said, Americans don't really know what it means to be Vietnamese or what is Vietnamese. And I found that in my experience, it's like people think it's like street food, a friendly country, Vietnam War. What do you think that means for the future of Vietnamese identity as like, you know, your generation, our parents' generation passes away? And especially for myself, like, you know, I'm in my 20s, but a lot of my peers who are also Vietnamese don't know anything. And I, mm. you know, I'm a little bit in a unique situation since I live in Vietnam, and I've done a lot of research into mm -hmm. this, but what do you think the future of Vietnamese identity is if this continues where a lot of people of my generation have no idea what it means to be Vietnamese? So the question is from a Vietnamese American gentleman who is in Saigon, happens to be in Paris, but is about you know what does what will happen to Vietnamese identity as our parents' generation passes on and so on, and our connect, living connection to history disappears. And I think that's uh, that's something that I thought about a lot because um, I, I think there's two two responses to that. On the one hand, I think because I've been obsessed about the past and about history, um, I've d d done my best to try to excavate that history and tell stories that I, I think have not been told before. Because again, obviously there's a, there's a plethora of stories about Americans. If you go to Vietnam, there's all kinds of stories about North Vietnamese communist experiences. But even the people in Vietnam don't want to hear about those experiences because they're, they're so boring. They're, you know, they're, they're propaganda told by the state. So even though the past seems as if it could be exhausted, like haven't we seen enough Vietnam War movies? Mm -hmm. Haven't we seen enough communist propaganda? I think the issue is that the past is not exhausted because those two types of narratives have tried to monopolize the past. And there's such a huge number of stories that have not yet been told, there's still a reason to go back and deal with that history. So there's a, there's a, 
there's a, a reason for people like me to exist. On the other hand, I, I really think that it's important for people to move on. You know, I don't understand what people who were born in the last 20 years, for example, think in Vietnam or in the United States, as Vietnamese Americans, let's say, about what's important to them. And I'm not one to tell them. I mean, you can't go up there and say, you have to remember your past, you have to remember the Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, well, they want to, they want to, they want, I have, I know people who are back in Vietnam, you know, trying to make the next big Vietnamese or blockbuster or, or romantic comedy. Nothing to do with the past. That's important too. So you have to do both things at the same time. But you can't do one thing by itself. That's, that's I think, the primary challenge that we confront when it comes to talking about a traumatic past, which we want to deal with, but which we want to be able to move past at the same time. So we need people doing both kinds of, of work. And then what, what, it, what it means in terms of, terms of identity, I have no idea. It's the next generation that's going to figure that out. Uh, yeah, orange shirt? Did you say that uh, San Jose has the largest, second largest community of Vietnamese um, today? Outside, uh, yeah, outside in, in the United States. I was wondering what the first was. Um, Orange yes, County. Orange, Orange County. County. Orange County. Orange County. <laughs> Little Saigon in Orange County. I can tell there's some OC people. <laughs> 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 Are there a lot in Louisiana? I'm originally from We're all over the place. Yeah, there's a big community in Louisiana, a big community in Texas, in Arlington, Virginia, in Seattle, all over the place. But the largest, I mean, basically the, the capital of the Vietnamese diaspora outside of Vietnam and the heart of the anti-communist resistance is in Little Saigon, California. Okay. Yeah. And in San Jose as well. In San Jose as well, but again, everybody looks towards uh, Bolsa Avenue in <laughs> Westminster. <laughs> Foot Foot top. San Jose, California, yes. Right. Uh, you describe a very gruesome rapes and murders uh, there are several other stories, but uh, this one in particular. And first, we all know that rape is a weapon of war and perhaps it's a metaphor for the rape of culture for the book. But I'm wondering, you seem to write that from the point of view both of the narrator who's witnessing it and the point of view of the victim, the woman who is undergoing um, this horrific experience. And I wondered if you would be willing or could comment on where they came from. So the question is about, in case, sorry, in case you haven't finished the book, the question is about something that happens at the very, or is revealed to happen at the very end of the book, which is this, this horrific rape of a communist agent by South Vietnamese policemen that is witnessed by my narrator, the sympathizer, and he can't do anything about it because he's a South, he's, you know, under disguise as a South Vietnamese policeman. So, why did I do this scene, which is a scene that uh, many readers have found to be difficult to read, obviously, but many readers have also found to be objectionable, like, did you have to do this? Did you have to depict this scene? Did it have to be this kind of an atrocity? Did it have to be this graphic? Aren't you a sexist? Isn't the book sexist? Hmm. So, these are all valid criticisms. Um, you know, when I, when I planned the novel, I had a two-page outline, and uh, I was faithful to that outline up until about three-quarters of the way through. And in the final quarter of the outline, I thought it would end in the re-education camp with a big shootout. And even when I wrote the outline, I thought, this is not really how it's going to end. This is too Hollywood. I just have to have a target that I have to shoot for. But I didn't know what that target was. I wrote the novel. I inhabited my character's perspective. The entire novel is told from his point of view. And about two-thirds of the way through the book, I realized a few things. I realized that the, the whole book is being told from within a re-education camp. I realized that the whole book is taking place within his head. And I realized that the whole book is about him against himself. So there could be no shootout. It had to be, that would, that would be a false ending. The real conclusion had to be within his own head. And I realized that he had been hiding something from himself. Even I didn't know what that was. Like I did not know that there would be this, this atrocity that he had witnessed and that he had deliberately, not deliberately, but, but he, that he had completely suppressed. And so that was revealed in the interrogation scene that takes place at the end. He's forced to remember something that's so horrible that he has refused to remember it. Not because he did something, but because he did nothing. And the whole book revolves around nothing by the end. Confuses a lot of people, confuses me. But the whole book is about nothing by the end. And the final last thing I'll say is, why that? Why this atrocity? Could have been any atrocity, right? Why this atrocity? Well, and Nothing Ever Dies, I really talk about this very explicitly. That's what I say is, that when it comes to war, we as a society, and I think it's probably true of the French too, 
but Americans definitely are completely capable of talking about any kind of atrocity that a soldier commits except for rape. In other words, we, the Americans have no problem talking about the My Lai Massacre. Americans go and kill 500 civilians. Okay, we'll talk about it endlessly. But the fact that rapes occurred during the Belay Massacre, we won't talk about it, because there's nothing redeemable about rape. Atrocities and massacres, you could say, oh, our soldiers had to do it, fog of war, they were forced to do it, it can all be excused. But there's no excuse for rape. You're, you know, so that's why that had to be it, because it is, the, it is the one kind of atrocity that can't be redeemed by nationalist and heroic narratives. You have a follow-up. No, I just, my follow-up was, that was actually not my question. I, okay. That's really, I <laughs> right. Um, it was so real. Yeah. You are a man. You were writing, right. really, I would say, before you were a woman. Yeah. How did you do that? Okay, good. A, a, a flattering <coughs> question about that is Good. Okay. Um, uh, you know, the last quarter of the book takes place in the, in the interrogation sequence in the re-education camp, where none of which I've experienced has the rape. Never seen one. It is, uh, and and I, it was just an act of imagination. Like I said, I inhabited his point of view for so long. And one of the things that I realized is that I inhabited his point of view too much. You know, I enjoyed his point of view, even when what he was doing was really objectionable, which meant that it was actually pleasurable to write many of these terrible things. But as a, as a human being, I could look at the murders and the rapes that happened and the bad, bad stuff. As a writer, I'm like, this is a technical challenge. How do I, how do, I do this in a way that is realistic and, and in a way that still makes the reader want to continue reading? So I, there's no real easy answer to your question. It's simply did a lot of research. Unfortunately, if you do a lot of research about war, and, and you will come across rapes, you will read narratives of rape and so on. Um, and, you, uh, and I did a lot of research about interrogation and torture techniques. All of that helped me to imagine what that might have been like. Yes. Um, so, your book really resonated with me. I'm from San Jose, yes. I'm a big San Jose fan. I'm Vietnamese American, but I'm also Hmong American. There's a Hmong character in your book, and I was like, yay! And my grandfather was part of the anti-communist resistance in California. Um, and I think it was in an NPR interview where you said you wrote this book for Vietnamese. And it's really the first book that I've read from a Vietnamese perspective. Um, I'm curious to know why you chose um, your spy to be half white, actually. What was the reason behind that? Was there a reason? Um, why, why did I? Yeah. Why did I make my my spy half white? He's uh, he's half French, half Vietnamese. His father's a French priest, and the mother is a poor Vietnamese maid who's you know 14 years old when she's molested by this priest and produces our son, uh, produces our narrator. Okay. So the. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wrote this book, and this is in response to your first part of your question. Uh, I, I've said that I've written this book for Vietnamese people. And it's related to the answer I'm going to give, which is, you know, um, the easiest way to get published as a minority writer in the United States is to write for white people, basically. Okay? So that means you're always translating. Like I said, pho, delicious beef noodle soup, right? translate. But if you write for Vietnamese people, you don't translate, right? So I had to write the book for Vietnamese people because authors of a majority background with the privilege of being a part of the majority never have to translate, because they know that their audience understands exactly what they're talking about. So minority writers have to claim the same privilege. Even if we know that we're being read mostly by a white majority audience, you still have to write as if you're a part of the majority, not as if you're a part of the minority. So, writing for Vietnamese people. At the same time, the problem is, this is also a part of the racial dynamic in the United States, the temptation then to write for your own people, talk about your own culture, can, is very powerful and necessary can also be debilitating. Because if you know anything about Vietnamese people, for example, you know we're racists. In other words, irony is, I grew up subjected to anti-Vietnamese racism, anti-Asian racism. I would go home and I would hear all kinds of racist sentiments. So how do you reconcile these two things? And it's a very human thing, right? So for me, it was not enough to tell, the refugees is all about you know, Vietnamese people, because what I was trying to do there was to humanize Vietnamese people. By the end of that book, I thought, I've done my job. So with a sympathizer, I don't need to humanize Vietnamese people. I need to dehumanize. I need to, not dehumanize, I need to render them in all of their human and inhuman complexities. And so I made my narrator half Vietnamese, half French, so that I could reveal how racist the Vietnamese people are. Because there are a lot of Eurasian and Amerasian people in Vietnam and outside of Vietnam 
and all the stories that I've read, they were, they were subjected to horrible kinds of racism, not just by the French and by the Americans, but by Vietnamese people, by their own families. So it was crucial to make them half French and half Vietnamese to dispel any kinds of feel-good feelings that Vietnamese people might have on reading this book and to make them confront their own racism. And then it sets them up to be the perfect kind of character who embodies the East versus West dual culture, I'm torn between worlds dynamic, and it seemed very natural to constantly exploit those things. So, uh, have you ever had someone from, from that side of the, of the world come up and, and either commented or, or contested uh, your depiction of, of their side? And, and how did you deal with, with, uh, with their criticisms? Uh, so the question is about my depiction of communism in The Sympathizer and have I ever received any responses from people who have been sympathetic with Vietnamese communism? Yeah, for, pro from, that, from yeah, that side. From that perspective, whether I did a good job or not. And so I, either either uh, former um, combatants or, right. or their descendants. Um, I, I think I've met a couple um, hmm. uh, uh, of communist sympathizers or communists who've, who've said good things to me about the book. Um, so no, nobody, nobody uh, directly has said anything negative to me from the communist point of view. But of course, I think you know the Vietnamese government in Vietnam might have another opinion, which is why it seems, the book still seems to be a sensitive subject in Vietnam. And actually, directly to me, I've heard more criticisms from anti-communist Vietnamese people who simply object to the idea that you can write a book from a Vietnamese communist point of view. All communists are evil. You can't write a book from a Vietnamese communist point of view. And so I know that there are Vietnamese Americans, for example, anti-communists, who refuse to read my book simply because of the perspective. Thank you so much for, for coming.